My name is John LaBelle, and these are very brief descriptions of lectures I have available for cruise ships. So I'm going to describe lectures I have available on Gothic architecture, Baroque architecture, the culture and architecture of Japan, pre-Columbian architecture, and Buddhism in architecture. Gothic cathedrals, the birth of the West, meaning Western culture, we begin with describing how the early Christians chose the Roman Basilica over the Roman temple for their model for the early Christian church. I'll do a little bit about early Christian and Romanesque, but here I'll jump right into Gothic. And there's what we might call a Gothic cathedral crusade between 1150 and 1250, during which time 80 cathedrals were built and 350 other churches throughout Europe. It's a time of the emergence of the importance of women. Powerful French queens, courtly love. Here we have Chartres, France. On the top, we see the cathedral dominating the medieval town. These were pilgrimage churches. We'll look at Chartres, take it as our example for a typical Gothic cathedral. Look at the plan, nave, side aisles, transept, apse, the portal entry and the soaring vaults of the interior, the stained glass. And then we'll see how these ribbed vaults were developed, how they evolved out of Roman vaults. Look at how these things were actually built. They're huge! How'd they do that? So we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about how the structure works, what the flying buttresses do. Here are the flying buttresses at Notre Dame in Paris. They didn't use engineering in the sense of calculating the structure in advance, but worked more intuitively the way a violin maker might. Then we'll ask the question, why'd they build these things? And I'm going to propose that a culture begins by laying down its epic poem and its temple form. For Western European culture, the epic poems were the Arthurian romances, there's a quote here. They thought it would be a disgrace to go forth in a group. Each must find their own individual path. So we lay down the notion that the moral center is in the heart of each individual. The temple form sort of describes the spatial potential in which the culture can move. Standing in the nave of a Gothic cathedral, it's apparent that the descendants of these builders are going to be the people who circle the globe and go into space. You can see my full lecture on Gothic cathedrals, the birth of the West, by going to the front page of this website and also on YouTube. Another lecture I have available is Italian Baroque architecture. We begin with the term Baroque. It was a term of derision. It meant an irregular pearl. So Baroque architecture was seen as uh, irregular, distorted, not following the rules, contrasted with the more rule-oriented, calmer architecture of the Renaissance. So we need some cultural background. We have the Reformation, Martin Luther, and then the Catholic Church responds with the Counter-Reformation. This involved several strategies, but one of them was a grand architecture recreating the splendors of ancient Rome to draw back in the faithful. It's a time of the scientific revolution. We have the publication both of Copernicus and his putting the sun in the center of the solar system and Vesalius on human anatomy, both in 1543. And we see Baroque art here on the right, the Assumption of the Virgin, by Rubens, contrasted with Renaissance art from Angelico. And the Renaissance art is calm and cool. The Baroque is emotional and exuberant. So we're only going to look at two key architects. The first is Lorenzo Bernini, and he begins his career sort of seeing his career paralleling that of Michelangelo by doing a David on the left as Michelangelo's David static before the encounter with Goliath and Bernini's is in the midst of the action, the dynamism of the Baroque. 
another Bernini sculpture, The Ecstasy of San Teresa, and this ex erotic ecstaticism of before an audience, we see the box seat in the lower left, is again part of the idea of the Baroque. And so here we have this ecstatic engagement with the audience in Bernini's colonnade of St. Peter's, reaching out and embracing the faithful. The other architect we'll look at is Francesco Borromini, and Borromini gives us two key buildings, San Carlo alla Catrafontaine, with its oval dynamic dome and its richly complex undulating in and out facade, ceaseless play of concave and convex. And we see origins of that approach in ancient Rome, in Petra. And then the other building we look at by Borromini is San Ivo, with its richly complex dome. Look at the plan of that dome. And here we are looking up into it, and it looks very arbitrary and rich, but maybe it begins with a triangle. Then we'll put a triangle going the other way. And then every other point of the triangle will make an outward scallop. And every other point of the triangle will make an inward scallop. And we'll end up with the plan of the dome. So rich complexity derived from simple elements and simple clear rules. So you can see my full lecture on Italian Baroque architecture. There's much more to it than we see in the sketch and it's on this website and on YouTube. My next lecture, The Culture and Architecture of Japan, and we're talking about traditional Japanese architecture here. And first we'll begin by contrasting some of the art. It is a little obvious here, but on the right we have a Western painting, Leonardo's Mona Lisa, it's pretty clear what's the person and what's the landscape. On the left, the people are integrated into the landscape. Different attitudes of the human relationship to the landscape. We'll talk about that. Talk about the influences on Japanese architecture, the geography and climate, philosophy and religion, etc. And the characteristics of age and the characteristics of Asian buildings rammed earth podium, wood columns on stone bases, non-structural infill walls, etc. And these columns with non-structural walls, this is going to this is going to become very influential on modern architects. A lot of influence of Japanese architecture on modern European architecture. So here is some Japanese rooms, see the tatami mats, and there are these Layers of space. Japanese space is not so much volumetric as like the layers of an onion. We'll talk about that. And there's a flow between inside and outside. So even when these sliding wall partitions are closed, they're made of rice paper. So there's a lot of interpenetration between inside and outside, between the nature and the architecture and this Japanese attention to detail. We'll discuss that. And then we'll look at Shinto temples, which begin with an admiration of nature. And then the most important Shinto shrine is Isi Shrine. And a key thing about this is the wood is left naturally unfinished, so it will decay. And every 20 years, they rebuild it next to each other. They tear down the old one, and then 20 years later, they build on that site again. And on the upper version, you see its aging green mold has grown into the roof using the Japanese detailing as ornament. Then we'll look at Zen Buddhism, what that's about, and then see its influence on another major Japanese building, Katsura Imperial Villa. We see it deployed into the landscape, interpenetrating inside and outside, and it's very asymmetrical. And here it is integrated with its landscape. All human-made landscape, we'll talk about that as well. 
and we'll contrast Katsura on the left with a western building, Palladio's Villa Rotunda on the right, dominating its landscape, putting the human being in the center rather than integrated into the landscape. We'll look at the relationship of this architecture to haiku poetry, Japanese poetry, and then we'll see how this architecture became very influential on Frank Lloyd Wright, and through that very influential on the development of European modern architecture. Here we see Frank Lloyd Wright's falling water, like the Japanese architecture, very much integrated into nature. So you can see my full lecture on Japanese architecture on this website and on YouTube. Pre-Columbian architecture, another lecture I have available. And this is going to focus on Mayan, Aztec, and Incan. So we begin with a description of the European discovery of the New World. And then we look at characteristics of this architecture, a Mayan calendar. They had a complex calendar that combined a ritual calendar and an agricultural calendar. We'll see how that worked. We begin with Teotihuacan culture, just a brief bus ride out of Mexico City. We know very little about this culture, but it's sort of the source and the origins of the subsequent cultures. Very crisp, abstract architecture. Modern architects love this stuff. And we have Quaxquatl, a dying and resurrecting god, a serpent god. Here he is in his dying and resurrecting phases. These are front and back of the same sculpture. And the steps of a pyramid are the levels of heaven. And by implication, a pyramid also goes down for levels of hells. So we'll talk about the Mayan culture in the Yucatan and then focus on Chichen Itza, one of the Mayan cities, and look at the ball court. They had rubber, so they made these balls. They bounced through these rings. And then the sometimes it's described as the captain of the losing team, sometimes the victorious team is beheaded and these serpents spouting out of the neck are symbolic of the blood. Here is Pyramid of Kukukan, or the Castillo. If we look at the staircase on the left, how the zigzag, which happens at a equinox, is giving a shadow that is a diamondback rattlesnake, and there's the head of the rattlesnake at the base of the pyramid. And then the cenote, a sinkhole near the pyramid, is symbolic of the downward pyramid. We'll then look at the Aztecs and the legends whereby the capital city, Tenochtitlan, uh, now Mexico City, was born. Here we have a four-quartered city. Look at this uh, causeways in four directions, an island and a lake. Mexico City has filled in the lake, so it's a very precarious building there because the footings are not good. It's a filled-in lake. And we'll look at the temple complex where the sacrifices took place, and we'll talk about what those sacrifices were about, human sacrifices. And we'll look at the notion of human sacrifice and its role in agricultural cultures. The sacrifice is the harvesting of the grain, which is then reborn again. And then we'll look at South American cultures focusing on Incans, but we'll look at some pre-Incans. The Nazca Desert culture with their famous drawings. We see up here the monkey with his spiral tail. Maria Ricci here, who is a scholar of this material. And then we'll look at the Incan Empire and its system of roads. And much of the Almost all of the Incan architecture was destroyed by the Spanish, but they didn't discover Machu Picchu, which was probably a summer retreat for royalty, and we'll look at that in a little bit of detail. One of the reasons their architecture was destroyed, if we look on the left, we see the peg holes. There were plates of gold that adorned these walls over the stone, and the Spanish hold all that back to Spain. So that's part of what did in 
their architecture. And then we'll talk about Mel Gibson's Apocalypto and the politics behind the movie, what various people had to say about it, about its depiction of these cultures. So you can see my full lecture on pre-Columbian architecture on this website and on YouTube. I have a lecture on Hindu and Buddhist architecture. And so we look at the mythological center of Indian culture in the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita, which is one section of it, describes Vishnu teaching Arjuna, talk about what that meant, the role of reincarnation, the role of doing your duty in this lifetime. We'll talk about the geography of India and then how it's a mix of earlier Dravidian cultures and invading Indo-Europeans, how this leads to the caste system. And these invading Europeans came on war carts, which we see on the lower left. And this is going to become part of the symbol of the Hindu temple. So we'll look at Hindu temples and what they mean, how they're used. And in a way, a Hindu temple is a three-dimensional mandala. And a mandala is a two-dimensional rendition of a palace, palace of the deity for whom the mandala is. Typically, four walls with a gate in the center of each wall. So we'll talk about how a mandala is used in meditation and how it becomes a pattern for cities. So here's the Vasta Purusha mandala on the left. And then here's a plan of the city of Jaipur. And in the upper left, they run into a mountain range. So they put that last square in the lower right. These guys had a sense of humor. We'll talk about how you lay out a city ritually, how it follows a mandala form, and then how these mandalas represent a kind of unfolding of the birth of the universe from the Bindu, the original unity, into the multiplicity of the world. And we'll see the integration of that traditionally into Hindu life, not so much today. But here's a woman every morning. She uses rice flour to lay out a mandala. And in the course of the day, animals, vermin, mice, etc., come and eat the rice, and it dissolves back into the world. She makes So it's an offering. She makes another one the next day. On the upper right are patterns generated by sounds. You take a drum head, put sand on it, and then put a tuning fork on it, and you get these different patterns. And so these patterns are the vibrations of the universe. Hindus see an anatomy not only contained with inside the skin, but energies that go out beyond the body. And then there are chakras, which are energy points along the spine. And we'll see again how that's manifest in the Hindu temple. Then we'll look briefly at Angkor Wat in Cambodia. It combines some aspects of Hinduism and Buddhism. And then we'll talk about Buddhism, what it is and how it influences Indian architecture. Now, our key Buddhist example is actually often in Indonesia, but it's a, the Buddhist stupa of Borobudur. And right away, you can see, if you look straight down on it, this is a three-dimensional mandala. The levels of a stupa represent the world of desire, the world of form, the formless world, and then the void. And in Borobudur, you go up and then walk all the way around and see bas-relief sculptures of stories of the life of the Buddha. And here we see how it's very much a mandala. And then I'll contrast two of my favorite sculptures, David by Michelangelo and Prajna Paramita, goddess of transcendent wisdom from Java. And when we zoom in, we see that David has an individual interior psychological character. And the Prajna Paramita is attempting to transcend that individual character and be at one with a transcendent realm. So how does all that fit in our world today? Here is Sir John 
Jeans, a physicist and astronomer, he says, The universe begins to look more like a great thought than a great machine. So we're starting to see a lot of Buddhist ideas coming into the West. You can see my full lecture on Hindu and Buddhist architecture on this website and on YouTube.